So the first thing is that I believe that high school students in East Asia, for example, in South Korea and China, are a population for whom this idea of taking happiness seriously, of making happiness a goal in itself, could make a world of difference. Second, there are diverse options for delivering these concepts to students, and I'm going to talk about two of them. Um, so how did I end up here in Burlington with all of you? Um, a few years ago, after a uh, slightly unhappy college semester, I became very interested in what research had been done on happiness. Um, I came across the proceedings of the United Nations High Level Meeting on Wellbeing and Happiness that had been um, shown in New York. And so, in college, I was very involved with modern United Nations. We ran conferences for high school students from all over the world who represent different UN member states and discuss issues ranging from child labor to terrorism to human trafficking. And one of the conferences we run is in Beijing. Um, I wanted to run a high-level meeting on well-being and happiness because the students who participate in these conferences do a lot of background research, including they read a 50-page study guide, then they spend four days of conference discussing, debating, and writing about the topics. And not only would the students read about GMH and well-being and happiness indicators, but they would actually put them into practice. And so that's what we did. In March of this past year, 50 students from different countries represented Bhutan and France and Finland and Japan. And at the end of the weekend, they produced a UN-style resolution in which they laid out their instructions for improving global happiness and well-being. Deeply conscious that the pursuit of happiness is a fundamental human goal begins their document. And recognizing the gross domestic product indicator cannot properly reflect the happiness and well-being of people in a country, they offer a definition of psychological well-being, they call for environmental sustainability, they underscore the toxicity of unemployment, and so on, for several pages. After the conference, I asked the students in my committee about their experiences. All of them said that they learned things about happiness and well-being that they hadn't known before during research for the committee, and that the research process was personally valuable for them. Some of them had even spoken with representatives from UN bodies like the World Health Organization while conducting their research. This camel was given to me by the delegate representing the Kingdom of Bhutan in the committee. He's Bulgarian, but goes to school in Kazakhstan. At the end of the conference, he gave me this camel and said, I didn't know what to expect from this committee. It's a little unorthodox, but I was very happy here. I asked what he learned, and he said that he had gained a better understanding of the meaning of happiness and well-being on both a global and a personal level. One of the questions I was curious about in this committee was the degree to which students from different nationalities would agree or disagree um, about what happiness was. I couldn't draw any broad generalizations about the Chinese or the Indian or the Pakistani conception of happiness, but even during formal debate, I could glimpse how the students' personal backgrounds affected the ways that they thought about happiness. A subtle flavor to the experience that was interesting for me was the fact that this conference is, in fact, a competition. Heading into the conference weekend, I was mindful, to say the least, of the irony of discussing happiness in a competitive setting. Um, but I think that on the other hand, the small amount of pressure levied by the awards may have taken the experience closer to a real international collaboration. As one of my students wrote later, even the topic of happiness and well-being, which does not seem contentious at first, can be the cause for serious and comprehensive discussion. It's individual people, even in model United Nations, who are making the decisions. And in the end, from my own perspective and based on feedback from the students and their teachers, the committee was quite effective. Though Model United Nations is just an extracurricular activity, the students who come remember their experiences for a long time afterwards. And even the person who spoke the least in the committee spent four days thinking about what it means to be happy, why that's important, and how the UN could be involved with it. In the survey I sent out to my students later, I asked them whether their schools did things to improve their happiness and well-being. A few of them talked about academic pressure. It's a rather academic-oriented place, said one of the students, where grades are a top priority and everything we do in school revolves around quizzes, tests, and exams. That leads me to project number two, a second way to bring happiness and well-being to high school students. In preparing the background guide for the Model UN Committee, I visited Visao Futuro, an NGO in Brazil. This is at their headquarters. They teach high school students about gross national happiness and hedonic science, and then the high school students conduct a GNH survey in their community. Inspired by this work, I developed a plan for Project Hengbok, which I intend to implement in the coming year. Hengbok means happy in Korean, so this is Project Happy. In a nutshell, I plan to create an interactive curriculum of well-being and happiness for Korean high school students, 
focusing on adapting the research from different disciplines to the Korean educational context. The curriculum will take the students through ways of thinking about happiness and well-being, determinants of well-being, and finally practical strategies for how to improve personal happiness. There won't be any homework because these students have enough as it is, and instead the focus will be on opening conversations about what happiness means and how it can be attained in real life. Perhaps partly due to recent international attention on mental health in Korea, there, are, there is a wealth of public service announcements proclaiming ways for how to be happy. The curriculum will build on these existing materials that the students are already familiar with and discuss the evidence or lack of evidence behind them. For example, this advertisement talks about taking time each morning for tea in order to be happy, which could lead into discussions on um, mindfulness and meditation and time use. And then the curriculum will be implemented in classrooms. Recent graduates from American universities, including teachers and Fulbright scholarships, as well as interested students from Korean universities, will be recruited to work in the classrooms as long as we have the capacity to reach them. There are some shocking statistics surrounding high school students in Asia. One study reported that 50% of high school students in South Korea had had suicidal thoughts. This is a population that is young enough and interested enough that concerted effort in discussing happiness skills and happiness concepts could make a wealth of difference. Um, thank you for having me, and I look forward to the work.